last time we introduced the idea of a DFA. And recall that DFAs, that is deterministic finite automata, are um, made up of five components. Q, which is some set of states. Sigma, which is some alphabet. Q0, which is a member of Q. Delta, which is a function that goes from Q cross sigma arrow Q, and then F, which is a subset of Q. We often draw these as a graph where Q are the nodes, Q0 has an edge coming from off of the graph, the edges represent delta, and then F are nodes that have two circles. So let's explore today some example DFAs and some of the different kinds of DFAs that often show up. So let's ask a few questions. Let's make a DFA that accepts no strings. So a DFA with no accepts. Now it's a little bit tedious to write down a language, a DFA with no accepts. So what we often do is we imagine that there's a function called L that takes a DFA and returns its language. So what we want to know is we want to know if there exists a D where the language of D is equal to the empty set. Now there are in fact many, many DFAs that have this property, but here is the smallest one. So we have an edge coming from off of the graph and then uh, something that loops back on itself. So this right here is something that accepts no strings. We know it accepts no strings because no matter what string goes into it, we're always going to stay in this state, the starting state, and that starting state has um, no, um, uh, it's not accepting. You know, we could of course write this down in the tuple form as well. So we could write down that there's a state called A, the alphabet is let's say 0 and 1, the starting state is A, and the delta function says, you know, it's a function, that takes in qi and c, and then no matter what it's called with, we always return a, and then this accepting set is empty. So we could draw a picture of it, or we could write it down this way. Now, of course, you know, if we define a data structure to capture these five pieces, we could just write out um, how to construct this particular instance. So this is a DFA that accepts nothing. So let's come up with a DFA that doesn't accept nothing, but a DFA that accepts a DFA that accepts only the empty string. Only the empty string. In other words, where the language of D is equal to the set that only contains epsilon. And it's fairly straightforward to write this. So we would come in to an accepting state, because that's where we start whenever we get epsilon, and then we would have a transition no matter what we were given to another state that always rejects. Okay, so let's come up with another example. So what if we wanted to have a um, DFA that you could give any particular, any particular character and then it would accept only that character? meaning a string made up of only that. So in other words, we want to write down the set that contains just the character A as a DFA. Well, what we would do is we would come into an, to a start state. If we saw A, we would go to an accepting state. And then if we saw anything else, we would go to another state that was rejecting. So one thing that's interesting here is, is that we now have the ability to write down um, DFAs that are very similar to our formulas for coming up with sets before. We have a way of writing down the empty set as a DFA, epsilon as a DFA, and then singleton characters as a DFA. It would be really nice if we could come up with a way of writing down the union operation and the circ operation. If we could write down these three these two more operations, 
then that would make it possible for us to write down formulas like, well, take the set containing J, circ that on to the set containing A, circ that on to the set containing Y, and then union that with the set containing D, circ A, circ Y, and then that right there would be a formula to describe the set that contains J A Y and D A Y. And that way we could have a mechanical way of figuring out what a DFA was given a formula like this. So we've already written down ways of doing um, empty epsilon and singletons, but we don't have ways of writing down union and circ. So let's build up some tools to help us understand that. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing that um, I'd like to talk about um, is that we can write functions on DFAs that are not just the accepts function. You know, we, we already previously, last time we wrote, a function that takes in a DFA in a string and tells you whether that, that string is accepted. But we could actually write a large number of different functions that operate on DFAs, that ask different kinds of questions about them. For example, one question that we might want to ask is we might want to write a function that shows us all the different configurations that a DFA goes through as, um, uh, as it runs. So, for instance, what this would what this function would be like. So we'll call this uh, we'll call this trace. We'll call this trace. And what it's going to do is it's going to take a DFA, and it's going to take a string, and then it's going to return a list of configurations. Okay. And the way that this is going to work is. Um, Let's say that uh, trace will take D, which is Q, sigma, Q0, delta, and F, and some string W. And we're gonna, it's going to return configuration 0 put on top of a helper function called with D and configuration 0, where Configuration 0 is the pair of Q0 and W. And then our helper function is going to take our DFA, it's going to take a configuration, and it's going to return a list of configuration. So when H gets called with delta with D, which is Q, sigma, Q0, delta, F, and then a configuration that has qi and w in it. What it's going to do is do a case of a case w of if it got epsilon, then it's just going to return the empty list because there's no more configurations. And if instead it got cx, then in that case it's going to return c1 put on top of traces, or h, sorry, our helper function h, d c1, where c1 is equal to um, delta of q i c, and then the rest of the string x. So this is very similar to the accepts function, but it answers a slightly different question. Rather than telling you the final answer, instead what it does is it just tells you the sequence of trace, uh, the sequence of states um, that are visited. It's sort of, if you printed out this list, it would be the same thing that we wrote by hand when we explored what happened with each uh, machine. So in other words, what we wrote before the accepts function is kind of like the evaluator for a DFA, whereas this is more like a debugger. It shows you what each individual step is. So we can write other kinds of functions as well, functions that don't just 
um, return an answer uh, about what the machine does, but some other property of it. For instance, one question that you might ask about a DFA is, um, does it accept anything? Does a DFA accept anything? So we can phrase this as a question, as a function. We can phrase this question as a function called example. And what example will do is it will take a DFA and return either false if there's no example or a string. Now let's step back for a moment and think about how this could work. So how could you figure out if a DFA accepts anything? Well, we know that a DFA accepts something if there is a path from the start state to some final state. So that means that we start at some state and there's a bunch of steps that eventually get us to an accepting state and there's no more stuff. And each one of these was labeled with some label like A, B, C, D, E. Well, if we know that that path exists, then that means that the string A, B, C, D, E must be inside of the language of this DFA. Okay? Well, that basically tells us that we can do, all we need to do is do a graph search. And then if we can do a graph search, then we know that there is an example inside of this. So let's write some pseudocode for this. So we have our example function, which takes in q sigma, q0, delta, and f. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a set of states that we visited, v, and the states that we haven't visited, um, we'll call that h for haven't visited, and that'll start off as q. And we're going to say, wow, is this the right way to do this? Mm, actually, let's, it's not that we, uh, it's not that it starts off as all of them. We only look at a few to begin with. Okay, so we only start off with Q0 and Epsilon. All right. So while h isn't empty, what we're going to do is we're going to let qiw equal the first thing inside of h. And then we're going to set h equal to h rest. So we're going to pull off the first thing and name its components qi and w. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say if qi is inside of f, then we're going to return w because we found something. Okay? And then otherwise, what we're going to do is we will, uh, what's the right way to do this? We're going to for c inside of sigma, so we're going to look at every single character inside of sigma. We're going to say if, well, we'll say let qj equal delta of qic, all right? Then, ooh, I'm going to do something scandalous. I'm going to move up the page. Then we're going to say if qj is not inside of v, Then we're going to put it inside of v. So we're going to say v equals v union qj. And h is going to equal h union qj. Then our string w and then c at the end of it. And then we're done. And then if we get through this whole thing, then we're going to return false. And so what this function does is we start off with just the start state, q0, and then the path is empty. Well, there's nothing there. We're going to look at the first thing and pop it off. 
If we got to a final state, then we'll return the path that got us there. And then we're going to consider every possible element of the alphabet and then see where it would go, see what is pointed to by the graph in the graph. If we haven't seen that before, then we're going to add it to the list of stuff that we have seen. And then we're going to, um, uh, and then we're going to uh, uh, include that. I guess we should include Q, uh, Q0 here at the beginning as well. Okay, so this function right here, it asks a different kind of question. It doesn't ask the question, um, you know, what happens when we run this DFA on one particular example? It says, given some DFA, tell me something that is accepted. Okay, so these are both examples of functions that, um, that look at DFAs and answer questions about them. One says what, tr what happens on a particular trace, one says what it can do overall. We can also write um, functions that produce DFAs. In some sense, actually, this picture right here is a function that takes a DF that produces a DFA because this really right here it takes a character and then returns a DFA that is specialized for that particular character. But we can actually think about this operation right here of union as being an example of a function that takes uh, two different DFAs and returns a third DFA. But let's actually get there with baby steps by doing another little small example function. All right. So let's write a function called complement. And it's going to take a DFA and return a DFA where the language of D is going to equal the complement of the language of the complement of D. In other words, we take the language of the complement and then that's what the language of D is supposed to be. So this complement idea that exists on sets, we can also make it work inside of DFAs. Now this is actually a fairly straightforward function to write. Its input is Q, sigma, Q0, delta, and F. And we need to return, we need to return something that has a Q, something that has a sigma, something that has a Q0, something that has a delta, and something that has an F. Well, I've written a prime version of those. So if you have one DFA, and you want to return another DFA that says yes whenever the first DFA says no, and says no whenever the first one says yes, you don't actually need much new things. The states can be the same, the alphabet is the same, the start state is the same, even the transition table is the same. The only thing that's different is f. f prime is going to be equal to f complement, i.e. it's going to be equal to q minus f. We take all the elements of q and we subtract the elements of f. So let's look at an example of that. So we have our all zeros DFA which says yes to empty. Whenever there's a zero, it stays there. Otherwise, it goes over here, and it returns on a one. And then on a zero or a one, it stays there. So let's write the complement of this. So the, um, the arrows are the same. OK, but the things that are circled are different. So this one is now circled. So this is no longer all zeros DFA. It's not all zeros. So it says yes whenever there is at least one one. So if there's a one anywhere inside of it, then it will say yes. And there have to actually be a one. It can't even be empty. So it's not all zeros. OK, so that was kind of baby steps, writing a function that takes um, that takes one DFA and returns another one. Now let's make this a little bit more interesting. So next, let's write a function for union.
So union is going to take two DFAs and return a third one. So when we, the language of union AB is going to be equal to the language of A union the language of B. All right. So union's arguments are going to be, we'll call it QA sigma Q A zero. Actually, let's do let's call it Q zero A. Then it'll be um, delta A and F A. And then they'll also have an argument Q B sigma Q zero B delta B and F B. All right. And we need to return a new uh, machine, QC, Sigma, Q0C, Delta C, and FC. Alright, now what's the idea of this? You can think about DFAs as being like um, as being like little circuits where into one side come characters one at a time and they say yes or no at the very end once they see a whole stream of them. You can kind of think of it as at any moment they're saying yes or no based on whether the state that you're in right now is accepting or not. So at the end, one of them is going to say yes and one of them is going to say no. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll both say yes, maybe they'll both say no. What we need to do is we need to have like an or of the answer. But we want each machine to run totally independently. Well, we can actually do that by making it so that the elements of QC are actually composites of the elements of A and B. We can write them, we can make them literally pairs. So we can say that the elements of QC are the elements of QA paired up with the elements of QB. Now, I've used this X before a few times, but let's, uh, let's take a little tangent and remind you of what it is. A Cartesian product, Cartesian product of two sets, um, X cross Y, so, hmm, that's, that's kind of annoying because there's multiple x's there. I'll choose different letters. We'll say that um, a comma b is an element of f cross g if and only if a is an element of f and b is an element of g. So a Cartesian product of two sets is a new set that's made up of pairs of the individual elements of the input sets. So in this case, the elements of QC are pairs of, on the left, an element of QA, and on the right, an element of QB. Okay? The start state of QC will just be a pair of the start state of QA and the start state of QB. The delta function, so delta C, We'll take as an argument QI, so let's write QA and QB, and then some character C. And then what it's going to return is it's going to return a pair of delta A QA C paired up with delta B QB C. Now the only thing that's a little bit tricky is writing down FC. So because this is a union, that means either side can say yes. So the way that we do write this is we say that we'll have all of the states, all of the accepting states of A paired up with any state of B, unioned with any state of A paired up with only the accepting states of B. So this right here completely defines an output DFA. Let's look at a concrete example of that. So let's start off with, what page am I on? Seven. So let's start off with the even length machine. So even length, we have the A state 
and it's accepting. And on a 0 or a 1, it goes here. And on a 0 or a 1, it goes back, and that's B. And then let's have the all zeros, where we start off in the X state, and we say yes. If it's a 0, we stay there. Otherwise, we go here, and we loop. We'll call that Y. Okay, so these are the states, this is, this DFA is A and this DFA is B. So that means that the states are going to be A paired with X and um, A paired with Y, as well as B paired with X and B paired with Y. So those are the states. The start state is going to be the start state of this paired with the start state of that. So this is going to be the start state. Okay. The accepting states are any one that has an A or an X. So that means this is a start. This is an accepting state. This is an accepting state, and this is an accepting state because these two have X have A's and these two have X's. Now, what are the arrows? Well, the arrows are just the union of the arrows. So over here. Anytime there's an A, it's going to go to something that has a B. Anytime, so like let's look at this one right here, AX. The A goes to a B on a 0, and the X goes to an X on 0. So that means that there's an edge here on 0. But on 1, the A will go to B, and the X will go to Y. So that means on a 1, we go down there. Now look at this state. On a 0, B goes to A, that's the left side of the diagram, and X on a 0 stays in X, so that means that we go back to here on a 0. Um, <coughs> on a 1, B will go also to A, and X will go to Y, so that means on a 1, we go down here, because the B Oh, whoops, that's a mistake. Sorry, selection. The B goes to A and the X goes to Y. So that means on a 1, we go right there. This one right here, AY, on a 0, A goes to B, and on a and um, Y goes to zero goes to, goes to Y. So that means that we go over here on a 0, um, as well as on a 1, I believe. Yep, on a 1 we go there also. Now over here, on a 0, B goes to A, and Y, and then this goes back here, on a 0 or a 1. Okay, so this machine right here is the output of calling union on these two inputs. So it's a way of combining two machines together. Now one thing that's interesting is, is that we can make a very slight modification to this, I'll write down here FC prime, to make it so that these is the union. If we take FA and pair it up with FB, then now it is the intersection and not the union. Because here, both of them have to say yes, but they can say yes however way that is. So in this case, it would be only the AX state. That would be the only way that it could work. So that would mean that there would have to be all zeros, and there would have to be an even number of them, and that would be um, that would uh, that would be the intersection of these two things. <clears throat> so this is an example of a um, uh, this is an example of an operation that takes place on entire. Um, Um, on entire DFAs, where it's answering this large question about them. How can we, um, you know, we can figure out an example, we can figure out the complement, we can union them together. Here's an example of union them. If we can union them, then we can intersect them. What's another question that we might ask? We may want to ask the question, given 
DFA A and B is the language of A a subset of the language of B? Is that possible? So let's think about how that would be the case. Well, remember, what does it mean for something to be a subset? So A is a subset of B, if and only if, for all x inside of A, x is inside of B. OK. Now, that definition right there is not really amenable to a kind of, um, to an algorithm. Because x inside of A, if we're talking about DFAs, um, may be infinitely large. There might be an arbitrary number of things inside of it. So therefore, we can't really keep track of all the different possible elements. So we can't actually go through and count every single one and test it. So we need to figure out some other way of answering this. Of course, if, um, you know, if A and B were finite, it would be possible to do that. But with DFAs, it's more complicated. You know, so, you know, how could we answer the question whether or not, like, even length is a subset of this combination? It should be, right? It should be true, but it's not obvious how to do that. Well, there's kind of a clever trick that we can do. So let's think about, um, about what it would mean for A to be a subset of B in terms of pictures, okay? So with that, what I mean by that is that suppose we had a set of stuff, the A stuff, and we have a set of stuff, the B stuff. How could these be related to one another? Well, one thing that could happen is, is that um, A could be over here, and B could be totally separate. That would be one possibility. It could be that A is large, and B is inside of it. It could be that B is large and A is inside of it. It could be that they overlap in some way. Okay, So these are roughly the three different ways that it could be. Well, how can we define each one of these situations? Well, take a look over here, for instance. This area inside here is A, and this area over here is the complement of A. It's the stuff that's not inside of it. So we have A, and then we have not A. Okay? Now the question is, A is a subset of B if something is true about the stuff that's not inside of A. Okay? Actually, yeah the stuff that's not inside of A. So let's take B and intersect it with the stuff that's not inside of A. That means that we're seeing whether or not there's any stuff that isn't inside of A that is inside of B. Well, I think actually we want the opposite. Let's just think for a moment. Yes, we want the opposite. So we're interested in the stuff that's not inside of B and intersecting that with A. So we take the stuff that's, if we take B and we take all the stuff that isn't in it, and then we intersect that with A, if that is empty, then that means that nothing inside of A was not also in B. So how can we answer that question that the complement of A intersected with, the, sorry, the complement of B intersected with A is not empty? Well, it's actually really easy to do this. What we can do is we can call complement on B. Then we can call intersect on that and A. Then we can call example. Remember our example function. And we want that to be equal to false. Because if there's no example of something that's not in B but is in A, then that means that A must have been a subset. So this right here is a little formula that defines when A is a subset of B. Okay. 
we can use that to do something more interesting as well. We can actually figure out if a and b are equal with one another. Because a and b are equal if and only if a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a. So if those two things are true, uh, then that must mean that the two sets are equal because there's nothing inside of either one that's not missing. We can actually have a whole, there's a whole field that's all about trying to answer questions like this, uh, and it's called model checking and verification. And formal verification. And the way that this field works is basically that um, we take a program and we abstract it into a DFA. And we take another, and we take a specification of what we want the program to be able to do, and we um, we define that as a DFA too. And then we ask the question whether or not one is inside of the other, and that tells us whether or not all the behavior that the program exhibits is actually allowed by the specification. This is a major area that I highly recommend um, you uh, you know you look into more um, on your time. But you know, we've done quite a bit just now. We've defined this function that tells us examples. We've defined union or complements. We've defined unions. We've defined um, intersection. We figured out how to do subsets and how to do equality. But unfortunately, we don't yet have the tools to be able to write down the J day. Um, uh, set using a formula like J circ A circ Y union D circ A circ Y. And the main reason why we have not, why we're not able to do that is because of this circ operation. So how could we do circ? How could we write a function that is circ? It would take one DFA and then another DFA and return a third that combine them together. Well, it turns out that it's quite difficult to do this, so we're going to talk about that next time.